A couple of weeks ago I did a video on signals but this time it's what happens below the baseboards and if you don't know your anodes from your cathodes you will after this. Hi welcome back to Chadwick Model Railway I'm Charlie. Now a couple of weeks ago I produced a video on signals and during that video what we looked at was signals from the ground up um, but this video will kind of be based on from the ground down i.e. what wiring you can put in or whatever to operate them yourself. Now I understand that a lot of people do still like to use the sort of um, the rod ones to operate their semaphore signals and I quite understand why and I also came in <laughs> came into some criticism <laughs> nothing new there, there really is there some criticism in the last video for not mentioning semaphore signals. Semaphore sig? Yep, I didn't mention semaphore signals and I'm sorry but we will leap into semaphores on the early part of this video so I'll, I'll, I'll cover um, the electrical operation of certain semaphore signals pretty early on. I'd also like to say at this stage of the video if you like my videos and I do ask you to give me a thumbs up by giving not only my videos but other videos um, that you like a thumbs up it um, appeals to the YouTube algorithm to then place those videos in the queues of other people of other like-minded people who have an interest in what I consider to be a very fascinating hobby so a thumbs up now and again would be much appreciated right signals glasses now I produced that video last week we no, two weeks ago which was video number 134 if you haven't watched it there ought to be a link up here that's not the first time I've looked into signals I did a video on signals which was number 104 and there should be yet another video up here and the reason I mention it is 104 is um, it looked at different manufacturers but also a little bit more about the theory of how the blocks occupied blocks in the real world of trains in the UK work and blocks are something you know that you really, really ought to get your head around if you um, have a ever deep understanding let's say of signaling so um, there's a chap called Steve Heaton from Block Signaling obviously uh, noticed that I in one of my videos I mentioned that I would be covering signals in the future Steve being a forward-leaning kind of guy sent me some free stuff so here we have um, various bits and bobs and we'll look at these um, but it's always always worth mentioning that if people send me free stuff they do at their own risk as a company found out when they sent me the DRM SPC100 um, speed tester. If you remember I did a video on speed and as the train went through it registered 98 miles an hour every single time. Um, I've mentioned it, it, I just ripped it up really on the video, it was a load of rubbish and now the company has got a major recall on all of those components so some good has come of it. But Steve I like your components and, um, and give an honest review. I'd like to say there's nothing in it for me bar a, free, a few freebies let's say which will probably end up in the West Camel Model Railway Society um, stowage to go into our future layouts. That's what I tend to do with freebies um, so be, sending me free stuff doesn't really give you an advantage let's say but we'll, we'll have a little look. These, there are no affiliate links for this so there's no gain for me. If you go and buy thousands of pounds worth there's nothing in it for me that way you know you're going to get an honest review. Right semaphore signaling let's take a look at that. I did mention in that video number 104 about semaphore signals and how they operate and block signaling god bless them sent me a DAP1-NS infrared dapole signal controller this little beastie here and if you have the dapole signals to take this and you fit a sort of small servo motor underneath then this, will allow, this detector will allow you to trigger those signals. Now a good friend of mine Ian who lives down the road he has an older layout so what we shall do now is go to his layout and have a look how he's installed them. So my thanks go to Ian let's go and take a look at Ian's layout. So here we are over at Ian's layout and it's, um, it's an oval layout but if you can imagine that the oval is squashed together so you've got an up and a down line that loop around banjos at either end uh, so there's a circular track on the left and right at the far extremes and as you can see it's very much work in progress 
um, but it brings Ian and you know other people involved with railway modelling a great deal of joy. On the right hand side there's an, sort of an, a country agricultural feel to it with a nice level crossing and uh, lots of work still to be done. And then over on the left hand side there's a GWR type station, probably 1930s feel to it and a lovely scratch built um, house under construction there if you can see. Now Ian's the first to admit he's bought three Dapol servo signals. There are these two uh, starting signals here in the station and there's also one by the tunnel mouth but he's made a fatal mistake with them really because he's placed the sensors too close to the signal itself. So as you can see here as we look down and to the left there is the sensor with its two sort of holes popping up but of course when the train goes over it to trigger the signal it's a bit late. Even worse in the stationary it's just a couple of inches so it's triggering it even later but this isn't insurmountable we just need to get underneath the boards and then move them about a foot because I think they should be about a foot to 18 inches so as this hole comes through it triggers it down goes the signal but sadly a little on the late side. There is a dwell time to the signal as I've mentioned and when the dwell time expires the signal comes back up indicating that the block that the hall has just gone into is occupied and obviously then the block for the station should be clear and as we bring the rail car in and that triggers its signal again late but not as late as the hall and then the rail car goes into the station and once clear and the time expires this home signal will go back to danger. Obviously this sensor should have been put in the tunnel well before the tunnel was built that is. Looking into the station so as the rail car moves off and triggers those uh, the sensor as you can see it's too late but as I mentioned it's not an insurmountable thing but for, as, for as far as controlling semaphore signals this is a pretty nifty idea. Under the board there are there's the electronic gizmos which are all quite straightforward and the paperwork's good to go with it and there's a heartbeat LED just to let you know that it's happy and all online and there are the two from the station area. Ian isn't all into electronics it's, uh, it's a DCC layout that he likes the tactile inter interaction as it were with his railway and these uh, all his slow motion points are activated by switch and why not because you you know having DCC and train controller eye train you can get all carried away with these things sometimes you just want to throw a switch. Now that piece of footage at Ian's was shot a couple of days ago and since then in conversation with another fellow modeler I've been thinking that perhaps the sensor and the signal by the tunnel mouth isn't quite right as in Obviously being a, a GWR signal they operate to the go position in that in the, there are lower quadrant signals so the arm drops to allow the train through. If the default position of that signal were to be in its lower position i.e. that the block ahead is clear and the sensor was then placed beyond the signal so the train would come out of the tunnel mouth the signal would be uh, at, uh, a clear at go in the, as in the down position the train would then go past the signal, trigger the sensor and the arm would then come up to show that the subsequent block is occupied i.e. by that train going into the station and then after a certain amount of time the signal would go back to um, its down position allowing more trains to come through and I, it seems to make sense that the, its default position would be down you would just then adjust the dwell time that it's down for to a uh, sorry that it's up for at the horizontal to be a, a quite a substantial period let's say to allow your train in the station and then to go on. Um, if you use these DAPO signals and you've got the servo perhaps you'd like to leave a comment on what your thoughts are especially if you're using um, one of these uh, block signals detectors to see if we are using it the right way. Invariably it, <laughs> signaling is an absolute nightmare and we're not all experts and, and clearly I'm not but semaphores is something I'm not really all about on. I am fairly swept up on illuminators, on the light signals, I understand how blocks work but to turn the clock back into the 1930s um, I really don't know if blocks, unoccupied blocks would naturally have a 
excuse the term green light, but access right through the blocks. I don't know exactly how it works between signal box and signal blocks, signal box and signal box to allow um, the, the through the through passage of trains. So perhaps you'd like to make a comment on that and, and help us out. Also on these uh, little devices, it's clearly worth mentioning that out there there is a, a program mode on the back and to that end you can change um, the dwell time um, so the uh, you can adjust how long the signal is 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 actuated for as it were um, and I believe you can uh, oh and sorry when the train goes over um, the dwell time starts when the last carriage goes past the signal not when the train initially uh, initializes it as it were so um, it start the timing starts when the last piece of the train goes past um, so that sort of makes sense and I think you can adjust the um, sensitivity of it and it's a, a pretty good bit of kit anyway Ian's pleased with them he's got three so do I recommend it well it's horses for courses but it seems a sensible option if you want some kind of automation and you have a semaphore based you know time machine back in the 1930s. Okay, let's crack on. It's next, it's lights. Now looking at illuminated signals, they fall into two categories. There's the LEDs that we all know and love on modern layouts, but if you turn the clock back, you end up with something called grain of wheat bulbs, as you can see here. This is an old smooth hour 12 volt power supply. And in here we have um, a three aspect grain of wheat lamp. And as you can see, the green is illuminated nice and bright. This thing, ouch, is actually too hot to touch. They draw uh, that much power and they obviously warm up quite considerably. And if you think these are a good idea, they're not, they're very old school. And if you come across them at a car boot sale or a model railway show, I suggest you give them a miss. The last thing you wanna do is spend a couple of hours installing these to find that the red doesn't work after a while. So it's worth mentioning, you know, turning the clock back, this is what um, used to be around on layouts in the olden days. Um, and if you come across them, just uh, give them a miss. Right, time to go back to school. So here we have a diagram with six LEDs. And this shape is a symbol for a diode. And a diode is obviously an LED stands for light emitting diode, and current flows in one direction. With LEDs, it flows from positive to negative, as you'd expect. And I've just coloured them in to make them look a little prettier. So, what happens? Well, there are two ways of wiring these things up there is the common anode and the common cathode. If it's wired for a common anode, then these three positive ends are joined and power comes in through a resistor because you've got 12 volts normally coming in through a resistor and because these need three volts so that's the way it's wired up and then these then would go to some kind of switching system so that the right ones are on that is a common anode in the uk this is not a common way of wiring because in the UK, we use a common cathode. So the common cathode is that they are wired together at the negative end and then through a resistor and then off on its travels. So there's some kind of switching mechanism or whatever would take place in this end. The, the illuminated LED powers up through the resistor and the circuit's complete. Common anode, common cathode. It can be a confusing system, and what I suggest you do is you take a screen grab of this, um, just take a picture and stow it away in your folder somewhere so when it comes back and you, you, you've forgotten how it is wired up, um, then you can always come back to this. Now let's just take a, couple, a look at a couple of signals. Now here is that thing of beauty that I bought from Absolute Aspects, and and turning it over to the base, you can see that one of the terminals is marked CN and that stands for common negative, which is the same as common cathode. So what would happen with the wiring up of this system? Because obviously you've got lots of options here with the feathers um, and, and the, th the three aspect light is you will have some kind of a switch switching system such as a rotary switch and that would then bring the power on to the relevant terminal. So 
it would go into here, then through a, um, a resistor and then out on the common negative or as we would know it, the common cathode and that is how it would work. So through your switching system <clears throat> into here, up onto say a feather with, an out, uh, with a yellow and then out on the common negative, quite straightforward. Here is a train tech signal. But because it doesn't have any internal switching uh, resistors, you then need a resistor on the common cathode cable. So obviously this is red and green for this side, red and green for the other, and this is used at a station platform for two, uh, two lines. So it's a starter signal. So what happens here is through your switching system, you decide to have a green light. So your, uh, your 12 volts, as it were, would go uh, be fed to the green cable post your switch. It would go up through your uh, LED, out through the resistor, which obviously then protects the LED because it can't take 12 volts, it can only take three. So the resistor then limits the current flow and exactly the same on the other side. Quite straightforward, another common cathode signal. And from the, um, the ERCO, ERCON stroke, um, BERCO, is it ERCO, er, ECON, sorry, ECON BERCO area, we've got this four aspect signal, slightly different again now, um, because we have, again, it's a common cathode. So what you have is your uh, red, yellow, and green uh, LEDs, but also there's another one with another resistor. So why would that be? Well, it's because two of these LEDs will come on at the same time because it's a four aspect signal. Might seem confusing, but be, if you have the same resistor controlling two LEDs, the LEDs may well have different strike rates or uh, um, they consume different amount of power. So therefore your two yellow LEDs won't necessarily both come on or they might come on with a different level of illumination. So it has to have a separate feed. Now, if we go back to our diagram, how does it work in this world? Well, all you would have is another LED coming in here, as you'd expect. There's your feed, there's your positive. Obviously it's a yellow. And it then goes out through its own resistor and on its way. They, they cannot have the same feed um, because of the different, the potential of the different strike rates of the LEDs. And if you've ever wired things up and wondered why one of them is dimmer than the other and they're using the same resistors and you should get two on, this is where the problem lies. And hopefully that all makes sense. Now let's have a little look at what block signal in the supplied to show you the differences. So sent to me by Steve Heaton, this is a ASP2-NS controller, which is a common anode. Now, as I mentioned um, on my little diagram, on a common anode, the positives are all connected together. And if I just zoom you in here for a moment, then hopefully you can see that the red line goes to all three LEDs and it's also looped around to the red LED. So the power comes into this, into the LEDs first, then goes into the circuitry um, and then comes out. And obviously the, the, the resistor here is internal into this component. Now if we wind out a little bit and I turn the lights down somewhat, Try that one there, take those lights down and power this up. You can see how it functions. Now, hopefully you can see that the green light is on. And if a train passes over the top of uh, the sensor, then the green light should go off and the red will come on. And then after a dwell period, which is adjustable, the red will go off and the first yellow will illuminate. Then it will be joined by the second yellow 
and eventually it will result, revert back to green. Easy. And then of course it triggers again and the process starts. And these periods are adjustable and also with this component um, it's not just a four aspect signal, you can have a two, three or a four on this item. Now let's take a look at the uh, common cathode. Now, as you'd expect, it's almost identical and this is the ASP1-NS. Wired up almost identically, but of course it's a common cathode. And if I zoom you in once more, hopefully you can see that this time it's all the negatives that are connected together running in from this negative line and also back out to, uh, over to the red LED. So in this case, uh, the power comes in on the red cable, uh, goes into the switching mechanism with the sensor and then come, and, and the resistors obviously go with it and then comes back through the LEDs and then back out on the negative. And if I dim the lights once more and plug this in and zoom you out first, and then the process is, is almost identical. Hopefully you can see a green light illuminated and if I trip it then the red will come on and after the period of time as usual the red will go off and the first yellow to be joined by the second yellow and then by the green. It's also worth mentioning at this point that if you've got this on your track and you've got an eight coach train, let's say, then this recycling time doesn't start until the last coach has left the, the sensor. This process of the timings will, will stay until the last wagon or coach or whatever has passed by the sensor. So what am I going to do now? Well, what I thought I would do is use this um, switching system here on my four aspect signal. So let's go and install this. Now hopefully you're familiar with this end of the layout. Obviously I've got my helix here. This is the rise that runs up to the station that will go above the helix and these are the lines, obviously the up and down line that go down to the helix and here is where I imagine a tunnel mouth will be because the whole thing is going to be covered. So there's my four aspect signal and there's the sensor. So what I need to do is just mark out there, drill a few holes and pop them in place. Well, the signal and circuit board are in uh, and all seems well, albeit temporarily. And I've just used a bit of black tack to hold this tunnel mouth. You can see now the flashing circuit board underneath to show you that all is well. So now let's run a train. So here we have our red light. Our first yellow, and she's well down the helix now. The second yellow. And the green. Lovely. Well, to be honest, that couldn't have been much easier, could it really? The little signal from Berker went in straight away. I could do with longer leads on the signal and in, 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 in the future I'll certainly make sure of that to give me for more flexibility when I wire it to these type of boards. Whether this is in the final place, I'm not too sure. I might just move it up here so that um, a train could see the signal easier from further away rather than around this bend. So that's probably um, not the ideal place. I think up here will be better, um, but that's no big deal. Just whip the, undo, the, undo the, um, the ferrules, uh, extend those wires and pop it up there. Piece of cake. Block signaling. Well done. I like it. Nice bit of kit that. Yeah, it's pretty good. It's, um, no, it's not pretty good. It's spot on.
Of course, if you're into further automation, they also supply these sequencing units where one signal will go red, whether the next one, um, next one back along the line would be amber and then, a, sorry, a yellow, then a, a double yellow and then a green. So um, all this world of automation is open to you, whether you're a DC or a DCC modeler. And DCC is where we go next. Okay, here's a high level view of the viaduct. And coming off the viaduct, as I hope you're aware, there are two right hand points and a diamond crossing. And obviously the purpose of these points is to split the lines into the two lines that go to and from the branch line station. And of course, the two lines that head off down towards the helix where we were a few moments ago. But of course, these, these points will require some kind of signalling. And just looking at the outside track here, I thought we would pop a signal over into this area here, that little uh, cutback area there, to control the traffic that goes on this outside line and then either diverts um, up towards the station or down towards the helix. Now, clearly we need a three aspect signal with a feather and this is where the great debate starts. So what sort of signalling do I require for the junction? Well, I had always thought that because these are the main lines that go down to the helix with the main traffic, that you would have a feather such as this one, which is a left hand feather indicating that the minor route goes off towards the branch station, even though it actually doesn't go off, it goes straight on towards the branch station. And therefore the main lines, which obviously wouldn't have a feather, would then go down to, uh, to the helix. But a good friend of mine suggested that that was wrong. <laughs> Nothing new there then. And the truth is because these are not high speed points and you couldn't get a sort of a scale um, model train to take these points at kind of 100 miles an hour because they are even though they are the, the long points, they are too sharp, that the diverging line will be the main lines because of the structure and shape of the rails, that the, those would be, require the feather and not going straight on towards the branch line station. I'm going to take his advice, though I would like to hear your opinion on this. I think it's perhaps a grey area. I know I've had, um, what should we say, interesting comments from two retired signalmen on other things that I've covered and they've put me straight and I am actually most grateful for their points, points, <laughs> points, did I say that, for their comments because it makes perfect sense and they're the experts and not me. I mean in reality what are we doing with these things? They're only eye candy aren't they? They're, we only put them on the layout to make it look good and so it's perhaps a little bit more exciting. Um, you, you know this in, in double O scale, one mile is 79 feet, yet we have a signal, you know, every four feet. I mean, it's ridiculous, but it's, you know, every set of points should have a, should have a signal of some description. It's just that as modelers, we compress our layouts um, to make it a much more interesting and make the best use of scale. Right, I'll show you what I intend to do with this. Now, here are three signals from Train Tech. This first one is the non-DCC type that I showed you earlier. And this one here is the DCC working ones and you don't have to worry um, about the anode or cathode mode to these because it's all in uh, inside here. And at the end of the day, all you've got to do is supply track power to either these two tabs here, which sort of go underneath the rails like the old Hornby power clip, or you solder on a couple of cables to these two small um, metal circles. And all you do is cut the tabs off, get rid of those and solder them on. On the back, there are two tiny little um, tabs here, which you short out to program the signal. And what I've done with this signal here is just that. I've attached it to track power, so all I'm doing, rather than connect it up to my bus, I'm just, uh, I've just hooked it up to this line, and as you can see, uh, the signal is indicating red. And 
I've got track power coming in on, on that side. And on those two little tabs for shorting it out, I've actually put two orange cables here so that I can reprogram it even though when it's fitted in position because I can just drop those cables underneath and give me access to it and those are the two cables at the back. So how does it work and how have I worked how, and what have I done? Now when you program this signal and I've programmed it as number 60 then the subsequent um, address is 61. So if I go to 60 and I throw it and close it, you'll see it change from red to green. And if I want to go to yellow, then I just switch 61, throw, and you should get a yellow. Easy. Go back to 60, switch 60, close, so back to red. But what about the feather? Well. The feather address is 14 because 14 is the um, address of that particular point. So if I change that point, then you will hear it motor over. So switch 14, throw and close. And obviously the feather doesn't light because we're not giving it a, a, a yellow or a green uh, light. So let's do it a bit different this time. So we want that to go. So all we would do is we would throw the point again. So switch 14, throw, and we want either a yellow or a green. So let's say we go for switch Oops, switch 61, we'll throw it, on comes the yellow and up comes the feather. So the train's gone through, I want to send the point straight on now, so if I change uh, 60, uh, so switch 60, sorry, switch 60, close, the feather goes off and the signal returns to red. And if I change the point, then it's switch 14, close. And the point changes back. All straightforward. And the, the, as far as automation is concerned, if you're using a product like train controller, then it wouldn't re know anything about having the feather. It would just operate uh, the the address of 14 to, to change the point and that would go with it. So it's an easy way of getting around sort of excessive logic programming into these type of uh, computer control systems. So now I've just wired the point up to the tracks on the viaduct and you can see the point concerned is right next to uh, the light. So if I then throw the point once more, you can see the point change but obviously the, red, the signal stays at red. But if I were to change to 61, uh, or, or to give me a yellow, or 60 and go green, let's do 60. So it's switch, 60, throw it, and up comes our green light with our feather. If, of course, I change the point, the just the feather will go out. So switch, four to, oops. Switch 14, close it, off goes the feather, but obviously you've got the green light left on, so it's then switch 60, close, and hopefully that should go to red. Well, hopefully you found that interesting. Uh, the first thing we did was cover the uh, semi-automatic operation of those uh, signals on the semaphore layer over at Ian's. We had a look at that uh, four aspect signal down there, which I think was a great success. And then finally, the more complex issue with uh, DCC. And obviously from that in the DCC world, you can then move into iTrain or train controller um, or, tra uh, or JMRI and use it as a, as a fully automated system. So, you know, there are levels of, of, of complexity with all this. 
I need to thank Steve from Block Signaling for the sending of that stuff. It was very good. I, I, I thoroughly believe in those products and there's no affiliate links, but the links will be in the uh, show more tab if you're interested in looking up. But please don't forget this, this little gem, should you get stuck, do a screen grab um, because this is, you know, can get you out of trouble. And I have to thank Richard, a good friend of mine who came over yesterday to put me straight on it because I had an issue getting around it. I, I, I couldn't see the, the, the wood for the trees. Hence, I have to do colouring in. Hey ho. So what's going on next? Well, in two weeks time, there'll be a lay layout progress uh, video, um, some stuff that's going on around there. And two weeks after that, um, it's, a, it's a, an in-depth uh, train controller, uh, block detection and signaling video. So that's for the, um, the more <laughs> dedicated people amongst us, let's say, the sad ones who need to get out more. Um, but I'm gonna go into that. Um, I mean, because, you know, block signaling is the way the real railway, ra railway, the real railway works. And it's, it's, it's a bit of a buzz from it. Hopefully you'll find it interesting, even if it's not quite your bag. Wrapping up then, I'd like to thank the people who donate to the channel. Without your support and with the patrons and the link is there, I couldn't do these. So thank you very much indeed. You make it worth all worthwhile and practical. If you haven't subscribed, there's a subscribe button there. And don't forget to give us a thumbs up and a video here and here. See you in two weeks time. Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>